Hello again everyone, and welcome back. My name is SRO, and in this video I'm excited to introduce the Lacerate Gladiator, a powerful and tanky melee build capable of frantically clearing maps and standing down the strongest of bosses. When the build is functioning at its peak, we can hit the physical reduction cap of 90%. Combining that with a heavily buffed Fortify effect, granting us 31% reduced damage taken from hits. All of that stacked on top of a 6200 plus life pool, a pile of armor, and a molten shell that when triggered can absorb up to 3600 additional damage, bringing our effective life pool up over 8 or even 9000 depending on how much armor we have when it's triggered. And the build is no slouch offensively. Lacerate received massive skill-wide changes in the last league 3.7 giving it a huge chunk of added physical damage and a drastically increased damage effectiveness at all levels. But the most exciting change brought versatility to the skill, with its functionality now intertwined with blood and sand. While in sand stance, the skill has substantially increased area of effect at the cost of some of its damage, making its clear speed and overall usability so much better. And then, when you go into a boss room, stumble into a blight boss, run into a powerful enemy that you want to take down quick, with one button, you switch to blood stance, and start dealing less area of effect, but in return deal more damage, have a higher chance to bleed, and deal substantially more bleeding damage. We'll be pushing Lacerate's newfound versatility to its limits by stacking as much physical damage and attack speed as possible, and by increasing the potency of our bleeds via cleaving, red storm, and bloodletting, combined with the keystone Crimson Dance, allowing us to inflict up to 8 bleeds on each enemy. We'll also be debuffing our enemies with Blind, Chill, Maim, Malignant Madness, and level 21 Vulnerability. All of these effects working in tandem to cause our enemies to be less likely to hit us, move slower, attack slower, and take substantially increased damage. And finally, to really put the bosses down, we're going to be stacking up to 7 impales with a 100% chance to impale on hit. And we'll be taking all of this defensive and offensive versatility and wrapping it in the shell of Gladiator. A powerful and genuinely underutilized ascendancy capable of granting us a variety of benefits. First and foremost, allowing us to maim, blind, and bleed our enemies and causing those bleeding enemies to explode, dealing 10% of their maximum life as physical damage, greatly increasing our clear speed. We're also granted consistent access to both frenzy and endurance charges, as well as more damage dealt and less damage taken, depending on the state of those charges. And if all of that wasn't enough, we get access to 20% more attack and movement speed via challenger charges, which we'll have up at almost all times. Lacerate Gladiator honestly does it all. It maps fast, it feels satisfying to play, and it can deal tons of damage to bosses and withstand just as much damage in return. With a bit of investment, a true candidate to take down just about all the content the game has to offer. So without wasting any more time, let's get into the fine details and discuss the gear choices that make this character as powerful as it is. I'll not be using a ton of direct chaos based prices in this guide. I will instead be using tiers of cost when recommending items based on their price. Cheap being 0 to 20 chaos, moderate being 21 to 100 chaos, and expensive being anything over 100 chaos. I'm doing this because prices in Path of Exile are dynamic and may or may not see some change after the video's launch. And with that being said, let's go ahead and jump right into our endgame weapon selection. With this build, we're going to be dual wielding two axes one of which is going to be a Soul Taker Siege Axe. This thing is honestly amazing. It gives us a ton of fizz damage, can be equipped really early, gives us resists, and causes all of our physical damage to chill, slowing our enemies. But all of that pales in comparison to the line, insufficient mana doesn't prevent your melee attacks. This thing single-handedly removes all of our mana issues. It allows us to leap slam and use Lacerate with no mana remaining at all, completely disregarding all mana costs for melee skills, meaning that even though Lacerate costs 45, we can still be attacking at full speed at all times and leap slamming frantically around the map for essentially free. This also gives us the benefit of being able to reserve near 100% of our mana, meaning that we can add extra things to the build with essentially no downside at all. Soul Taker rests in the early stages of the expensive category, but is worth every chaos. The raw power it grants us and the quality of life bonuses that it provides are really tough to match, and I highly recommend picking up one of these. And to go alongside it in your other hand is going to be a rare axe with reasonable physical damage. In Path of Exile, when you dual wield two one-handed weapons of any type, you gain these following bonuses inherently. While dual wielding, you get 10% more attack speed, 
15% additional block chance, and 20% more attack physical damage. These inherent buffs are perfect for the build and give us a gigantic boost to our damage and makes dual wielding an even more attractive option. This weapon slot is going to be flexible, but you're looking for a few key things. The first thing being a very fast attack speed. We're going to want to try to be pushing at least 1.7 attacks per second. Siege axes are going to be king here and can reach attack speeds as high as 1.9. Secondly, of course, we're going to want to be cramming as much physical damage as possible into this weapon. We'll be looking for a high percentage increased physical damage roll as well as a high roll on added physical damage. We're going to be looking for at least 300 physical DPS an axe of this caliber can start at the very low end of moderate, almost cheap, and can be scaled very deep into the expensive category, depending on how much damage you want to push into it. When picking up one of these, try to avoid elemental damage rolls and accuracy bonuses, as they don't do anything for the build, as we deal pure physical damage due to brutality, and our hits never miss because of resolute technique, which also stands to make any critical based rolls unhelpful as well. A couple other good stats to look for would be percentage increased damage with bleeding, additional quality, and increased elemental resistances. It's also worth mentioning for those on a budget that you can indeed drop the Soul Taker and run two rare axes if you're looking to save money. This is very doable, but will add mana issues back into the build. You'll have to sacrifice one of your auras to free up more mana to use on skills, and you'll also have to be looking to pick up some form of mana leech, either from your gear or from the tree, to help sustain our mana expenditure but my primary recommendation is a single Soul Taker combined with a rare axe that has as much physical damage per second as possible. Next up is going to be the helmet selection for the build, and that is going to be a rare helmet that ideally has an armor base. On that helmet, you're going to be looking for as much maximum life and as many resistances as you can possibly get. Additional stats to look for are going to include high rolls on strength, dexterity, and intelligence, percentage increased maximum life, and nearby enemies take percentage increased physical damage. You can find helmets like these from very cheap all the way to quite expensive. It really just fits your budget. This slot is very flexible, but primarily serves to boost our life and fill in our resistance needs here so that there's less pressure on other slots in the build. Now let's talk about the helmet enchant options that I would recommend for the build. We have three really good offensive choices. One being Lacerate has 40% increased damage. The second being Lacerate deals additional physical damage against bleeding enemies. And we also have Blood and Sand has 40% increased buff effect, giving us more area of effect in Sand Stance and more damage in Blood Stance. And a small mention for the defensive choice of Molten Shell has 40% increased skill effect duration, simply allowing you to be under its protection a little bit longer. All of these helmet enchants are very viable and quite flexible and are not currently very expensive, but will absolutely have some impact on the price of any helmet you're looking to pick up. None of these are required for the build and can be picked up at your discretion and based upon your budget. Moving right along, it's time to discuss the body armor selection. Now this is going to sound a little familiar, but once again, we're going to be going with a rare selection that has an armor base. We're going to be looking for a couple of really key stats. One is going to be a huge life roll, hopefully at least around 120 plus. Secondly is going to be socketed gems are supported by level 1 maim, in turn adding maim as a 7th link to our main attack. This grants us 15% more damage against all enemies as well as an additional chance to maim and increased damage against enemies that were maimed by the skill that this was linked to being Lacerate. We'll also want to be picking up as many resistances as we can for this build, making an Astral Plate one of the best possible selections. You'll also want to be looking for additional stats such as percentage increased maximum life and recover X percentage of life on kill. And once again, it's worth mentioning that when picking up this chest piece that we do not benefit from reducing the mana cost of our attacks or improving our critical strike chance. As it stands, at the time of recording, you can pick up a 6 link with some of these key stats for around the 1.5 to 4 exalt mark, firmly in the expensive category, but serves us as one of our best offensive and defensive options rolled into one, which I highly recommend. If you're on a tight budget and you're looking to go a little bit cheaper, I have a couple of suggestions for you. Both of these options are going to be combined with the Jeweler's Touch Prophecy, which can be picked up for less than 10 chaos. This prophecy allows you to use a single Jeweler's Orb to create a fully linked 5 socket item on any piece of armor or weapon. This will be one of the cheapest ways to get a 5 link on a piece of gear that actually helps the build. This will allow you to push into maps and start making money and working on upgrading the build and give you a platform to stand on. My first cheap alternative for the build is going to be a Duresso's Defiance Full Dragon Skill. This will be an armor evasion hybrid, but gives us some really solid benefits. A chunk of maximum life, 
some of our physical damage leached as life, which is nice, an additional chance to dodge attack hits, and finally, additional endurance charge generation, and also removal of those endurance charges when we're hit. Whenever we get hit, it takes away those three endurance charges, gives us onslaught for 15 total seconds, and grants us increased onslaught effect. This stat, when rolled well, gives us 100% increased onslaught effect, essentially doubling the bonuses we gain from any source of onslaught. Thus, when we're hit, we'll gain 15 seconds of onslaught, that grants us 40% increased movement speed and 40% increased attack speed. This is a very nice option for the build, but we will be getting the inherent 20% attack speed and movement speed of onslaught from other places in the build, so the bonus here isn't quite as big as it seems, but is still quite substantial. Best of all, you can pick up an unlinked version of Duresso's Defiance for very, very cheap. Our second alternative is going to be a Belly of the Beast. Another armor evasion hybrid, and one that grants us up to 40% increased maximum life, some resistances, and even improves our flask life recovery rate, which is huge for survivability. This chest provides us with just pure defensive capability, and is a fantastic option and can carry you deep into maps with no issues. And much like Duresso's, it can be picked up unlinked for extremely cheap, and combining either of these two options with that Jeweler's Touch Prophecy will get you a usable 5 link for almost no chaos at all. They're a final set of cheap alternatives that will give you a huge power boost and get you mapping faster. These are both going to be on the low end of the moderate expense category, but are quite affordable. First up is going to be a Tabula Rasa, capable of giving you a 6 link and all white sockets, meaning that you can socket in any color of gem. This will be the most flexible and widely available option to get a 6 link on the cheap. Our second and final option for a cheap 6 link is going to be to go to Path of Exile Trade, set the item category to Body Armor, the item Rarity to Rare, six links as your minimum, the link colors to four red and two green, and buyout price of specifically chaos orbs. And you'll be seeing a list of corrupted chess pieces, which means that you can't affect the stats on them and you can't change the colors of the links. Because in Path of Exile, when you corrupt the chess piece, it has a chance to become a six link automatically, meaning that there'll be a selection of six link armor pieces that just happen to become exactly what we needed for the build available for cheap. So now it comes down to you and your budget and the available selection. You'll have to temper back your expectations a little bit with these, as they are corrupted and are not going to have incredibly good stats in a lot of situations. Try to simply get an armor base with as much maximum life and resistances as possible. Try to be wary of chess pieces that either have a very high level requirement, or need a lot of intelligence or dexterity to equip, as it'll make it very hard for you to actually utilize the chess piece at all. With all of that being said, I think it's time that we moved on to the gloves. With my first choice for the build being a rare glove, specifically looking for a spiked base. We will once again be looking for a lot of those very solid core stats, such as a high roll on maximum life, and as many resistances as you can stack. Offensively, we'll be looking for increased attack speed up to 16%, and also trying to get as much added physical damage to attacks as possible. We'll also have the option to look for an Essence of Insanity crafted glove that has socketed gems have 16% more attack and cast speed. This makes for a fantastic place to socket in Leap Slam, which gives us a huge boost to our map traversal speed. And finally, the gloves will of course be a fantastic place to pick up additional attributes as required. These gloves will be available everywhere from extremely cheap to very expensive. It all depends on your budget and how many of these key stats you want to pick up. Getting a very well-rolled pair of Essence of Insanity gloves is going to be a little bit tougher and a bit more expensive, certainly entering into the moderate category, but is quite affordable. The rare gloves are extremely flexible, and you can use them to suit whatever needs you have for the build. Alternatively, you can look to pick up a pair of Tomb Fists as a one-socket version for very cheap. You'll want to go ahead and socket in a Murderous Eye Jewel that has a lot of life and added physical damage to attacks on it. With that Murderous Eye Jewel in the glove, you will then intimidate enemies on hit for 4 seconds, causing them to take 10% increased damage. For just a bit more cash, you can pick up a 1 socket pair of Tomb Fists that have a corruption that applies a curse to enemies on hit, those curses being Vulnerability, Temporal Chains, or Enfeeble. The prices here will vary quite a bit, but you can find them on the very low end of moderate into the low end of expensive. And finally, if you're very flush with cash, you could give some consideration to picking up a two-socket pair of Tomb Fists for very expensive. And with all that said, let's go ahead and hop into the boots, with my primary selection for the build being Combs Roots. These boots are amazing and offer us up to 200 to maximum life. They also completely prevent us from being stunned using unwavering stance. They also prevent us from being knocked back and completely negate the effects of being either chilled or frozen because our action speed cannot be modified below base value. It does come at a cost, meaning we have no sockets in our boots, and the boots also provide us with no movement speed. But in return, we can't get knocked back, chilled, stunned, 
or frozen. Very fantastic defensively and gives us our biggest bonus to maximum life. These boots are available for cheap. Even for a pair that has 185, 190 plus life, you can get them for just a handful of chaos. However, if you're looking for a very specific enchantment, they may rise into the moderate category. Alternatively, you can of course go with a pair of rare boots. If you're either suffering for the socket space, need resistances, or merely want the movement speed, rare boots are still a fantastic option and extremely competitive in this build. Of course, look for all the classics, go for a huge chunk of maximum life, all the resistances you can stack, and try to shoot for 30 plus movement speed if possible. You'll also have a fantastic opportunity to pick up additional attributes you may be missing, and also percentage increase to maximum life as per usual. Keep in mind that if you go for the rare boots, I will not be suggesting to have immune to freeze and chill on a flask, which you'll want to be adding to your build if you do so. With those options covered, let's talk about a few boot enchantments that'll be good for the build. My first and foremost choice is an easy pick, 16% increased attack speed if you've killed recently. This boosts both our DPS and our movement speed with Leap Slam. Really, really good for us. My second choice will provide just a little lift to the quality of life while playing this build, which will be 10% increased movement speed if you haven't been hit recently. It really doesn't do too much for us, but it gives us that little edge when maneuvering, trying to dodge, engaging mobs, or even just looting. It's not bad to have. And finally, we've got regenerate 2% of life per second if you were hit recently, 10% chance to dodge attack hits if you've taken a critical strike recently, and 8% chance to dodge spell hits if you've taken spell damage recently will all be decent defensive boosts for the build. And with that covered, it's time to discuss amulets. My primary choice for the build is going to be an Impresence Onyx Amulet. This thing is super nice and adds 16 to all of our attributes, a big increase to our physical damage, a chunk of armor, and maximum life, all of which serve the build in a really good way. You'll also want to be looking for one that specifically has vulnerability has 100% reduced mana reservation. This means that you can then add to your build a high level vulnerability linked to a blasphemy support. This causes whatever curse you socket in to become an aura, meaning that all the nearby enemies will be affected by this aura and automatically cursed for a limited time. The Impresence Amulet does not allow us to do this, but makes it so that it costs us nothing. It's completely free to have this as an aura, making this one of the best places for us to get this curse because we can utilize it at such a high level, making it much more effective. And a presence isn't even done yet, as it grants us Maddening Presence for 10 seconds whenever we kill a rare or unique enemy. This grants us a bubble around our character that inflicts malignant madness on our enemies, reducing their action speed and their damage. This is an effect that is fantastic when engaging with any sort of content. Slowing down your enemies and taking reduced damage will be useful in every situation and is fantastic of course against bosses. You can pick up an Impresence that has the proper vulnerability stat for around the very low end of moderate. There'll be a slight range there, but they can be picked up at quite an affordable price. And as usual, I would recommend as an alternative picking up a rare amulet. Taking the opportunity to once more get tons of life, tons of resistances, attributes, and stacking as much damage as possible, which on an amulet is going to be specifically getting a high roll of physical damage to attacks. Rare amulets will be available from very cheap to very expensive, you can pick one up that suits your budget. Next up, we're going to be looking to anoint these amulets, and I'll be discussing a few of the best options available to make that happen. First up, in the cheap category, is going to be Ambidexterity, which will run you a black, an azure, and an amber oil, costing you less than 10 chaos. This should give you about a 5% DPS boost, increasing your attack damage, your attack speed, and our bleed damage as well. In the moderate option, we're going to have Discipline and Training. This node is just a little bit outside of our reach and grants us 10% increased maximum life as well as 30 to maximum life. A fantastic boost and one of our biggest possible bonuses. Granting the build, at least at very high levels, nearly 500 total life. If you're even remotely happy with your damage, this would be my first and foremost recommendation. And in the very expensive category, we're going to be looking at Whispers of Doom. Now when I say expensive, I mean expensive. This is going to be a little bit below 400 chaos as it stands. This grants you the ability to inflict an additional curse, which will allow you to combine vulnerability with, say, Temporal Chains or Enfeeble. With Temporal Chains, you'll be slowing them down even more, causing their action speed to be reduced pretty significantly, and Enfeeble will cause them to deal even less damage, adding it to the pile of effects that we have that reduce the damage we take. A really great utility option, but only available for those who have a lot of money to burn. Any of these anointments will serve you very well, and of course there are still a lot of really good options that I can't cover in this video. Pick up whatever you feel will serve the build best. Moving right along to the rings. And who could have possibly asked? Oh, it's going to be two more rares. Incredible. 
But seriously though, the flexibility of this build is pretty ridiculous and you can basically fill every single slot with a rare option. This would genuinely be easy to recommend as a solo cell phone character, as you can genuinely deck this thing out in rare gear from head to toe and the only thing you would genuinely miss is a soul taker, but even that can be worked around fairly easily. When picking up the rare rings, the base can be hyper flexible, with one of the best options being a steel ring which adds a ton of physical damage to attacks as it's implicit. Any of the base types that feature resistances in the implicit or going for a coral ring for an additional 30 maximum life as the implicit, all of these will serve you very well. You're of course going to be looking for a pile of life, resists, and stats. Any intelligence deck dexterity, strength you need, you can also look for it here. Additionally, look for attack speed and physical damage to attacks as per usual, two of the best stats that we can get to boost the damage of this build. The ring slot also offers you an additional opportunity to pick up either the one curse you want to be using or to pick up an additional curse if you wanted to be applying two to your enemies. On the ring, look for either curse enemies with poacher's mark or vulnerability on hit. Rare rings are available for very cheap to very expensive and can be custom tailored to fit your budget. It is important to note, however, that adding a curse to the rings will reduce the selection available to you and will probably make the ring more expensive in most cases. These rings are once again extremely flexible. Utilize this opportunity to max out your resists, stack a ton of life, or stack in additional attack speed and physical damage if you've already got those aspects covered well. And for the final piece of direct gear, we're going to have the belt selection. With my primary recommendation coming as no surprise, it's going to be a Stygian Vise. The Stygian Vise rear belt is something that you'll see as an option at the very least in almost every single build. Its implicit is too strong, and it inherently destroys competition between the other base types in the belt slot, with its only real competition occasionally maybe being a crystal belt. Simply put, even with the Abyss Jewels being nerfed, it's still used constantly. I mean, even taking a look at a leather belt that has an implicit of 40 maximum life, which from a distance seems really strong, and it is. But with the Stygian, you can just have all those same stats, including the 40 maximum life, but also get a huge chunk of added physical damage to attacks. And some resistances, or whatever you want, really. They're so flexible that they can be used for just about any build. I love Abyss Jewels, and I love the variety that they bring to the table, but their inherent strength combined with the Stygian's ability to have all the same stats as another belt, even managing to comfortably compete and exceed the power level of the majority of unique belts that exist within the game. It just ends up feeling like too much. It's just simply bad design that a single belt base would have so much more versatility and raw power than anything else it's competing with. I hope this is something that they take a deeper look at in the future. But even with all that said, they're still around, they're right here for us, and they're very strong. So let's pick up our Stygian Vise. We're going to be looking for, of course, huge chunk of life, lots of resistances, but the belts are going to differ a little bit. Here's some additional stats to look for. First off, being a massive chunk of armor, up to 540. This is another great opportunity to pick up tons of attributes. You can also look for a variety of flask-based modifiers. You can get a percentage increased chance for your flasks not to consume charges, increased effective flasks, reduced charges used, increased charges gained, increased duration of flasks, and one of the best in my mind is going to be Flask Life Recovery Rate, which makes you recover much faster. Once again here, the world is your oyster, and you can go with whatever you'd like. These belts are available from cheap to very expensive, and you can pick these up according to your budget. And of course, you'll be getting that chance to use an Abyssal Jewel in the socket provided by this belt. I'll be covering this a bit more shortly, but look for life and added physical damage to attacks, and to axe attacks as your main priorities. Additionally, if you're on a pretty tight budget, you can go for a very similar belt. Look for all the same stats, you'll just be getting a leather belt instead of a Stygian Vise. This guarantees that you can have 40 maximum life as your implicit, which is already really strong and will serve as a fantastic alternative if you can't afford a well-rolled Stygian. Phenomenal examples of leather belts with tons of life and lots of resists are available from cheap to moderate. And with the belts laid out and the rants out of the way, let's talk about the flasks. Our first selection is going to be a Quicksilver Flask of Adrenaline. So in addition to its inherent 40% increased movement speed, you'll also be getting up to 30% increased movement speed during Flask Effect. This flask simply gives us additional smoothness, allows us to engage packs quicker, and just move around faster when we're not using Leap Slam. Alongside that additional movement speed, you'll be looking for increased duration or increased effect. Flasks like these should be available for cheap to moderate. Next up is going to be Lion's Roar Granite Flask, just a phenomenal flask in almost every single melee build. It causes us to knock back enemies, causes enemies to flee, 
and also gives us a gigantic chunk, up to 25% more melee physical damage during effect. So not only does the flask essentially grant us an eighth link for our damage setup, it also grants us 3000 armor, which when scaled, basically accounts for half of the armor that we even have in the build, and is fortunately available for very cheap. Next up, we're going to have a sulfur flask, a really well balanced option that provides us with 40% increased damage and also creates consecrated ground for us to stand on. Standing on Consecrated Ground for this build specifically grants us an additional 6% of our maximum life regenerated per second. Just like the Quicksilver Flask we discussed earlier, this is a Magic Rarity Flask, which means that it can have two additional modifiers. You're going to want to be looking for Immunity to Bleeding during Flask Effect, or Immunity to Curses during Flask Effect. Both those effects will also automatically remove any bleeding that is already on your character, or curses that are already on your character respectively. And the additional secondary effect that appears alongside this flask is completely optional. I like to go with increased charges gained or reduced charges used. You can pick up a Sulfur Flask with some of these stats for quite cheap. For the fourth slot, we're going to have the Fantastic Basalt Flask. This grants us a big chunk of additional physical damage reduction, helping us reach our cap consistently, and also reflects some of the melee physical damage we take back to attackers. On here, you'll want to pick up whatever modifier you didn't get on the Sulfur Flask. You'll want to be picking up either Immunity to Curses or Immunity to Bleeding, whichever one you didn't get this flask will once again be available for quite cheap. And for our fifth and final flask, we have one of my all-time favorites, which is going to be the Blood of the Karui Sanctified Life Flask. This thing is an absolute beast, and we can use it because we've theoretically already covered our freeze immunity with Combs Roots, we've covered our bleed, and we've covered our curses. So mapping is going to be really smooth, leaving room to pick up one of the best life flasks that exist in the game. This flask can only roll on the life recovery rate and can reach up to 20%. You'll want to try to get as high as possible. At its peak, with a high roll on recovery rate and when quality to 20%, it'll be recovering over 3,500 life over just 2.5 seconds, meaning that with no investment in flasks whatsoever, you'll be recovering 1,400 life per second, and if you don't make it to full by the time the flask is done with, you'll be recovering instantly up to full life. Just a fantastic option is available from cheap to moderate. And with that covered, it's time for our final piece of gear, the jewels. Within the skill tree itself, we will have access to four jewel sockets, and you can have more if you decide to use Stygian Vises or Tomb Fists. You can fill these with rare jewels, in which case you'll want to be looking for percentage increased maximum life, percentage increased melee damage, and attack speed, in the form of either just generic attack speed, attack speed with axes, one-handed melee weapons, or while dual wielding. They will all serve the build just fine. And if you decide to go for Abyssal options, you're going to want to pick up Murderous Eye Jewels that have a maximum life roll of ideally 30 plus and feature physical damage to attacks, physical damage to axe attacks, or even increased attack speed. For both of these types of jewels, our mod selection is very limited, so focus on getting tons of life and tons of attack speed, and perhaps increased damage where you can. We'll also, budget permitting, be looking to pick up a Watcher's Eye Jewel. We'll be looking for modifiers that specifically affect pride. You're going to be looking for percentage increased chance to deal double damage, your hits intimidate enemies for 4 seconds, impales you inflict last 2 additional hits, and percentage increased attack physical damage. All these options will serve you very well, and you can look around and try to find something that suits your budget. My primary recommendation would be to go for Impales You Inflict last two additional hits. In Path of Exile, Impale is a mechanic that allows you to stack additional physical damage against targets that you've been hitting repeatedly. When you hit a target and apply Impale, it's going to record 10% of that hit's physical damage before any damage mitigation is applied. It will then deal that damage on resounding hits as reflected physical damage, which is different and independent from the core damage you'll be dealing. This effect will continue to stack on resounding hits, impaling enemies again and again and again if you have a 100% chance to impale, which we do causing us to deal more reflected physical damage to the enemy on each resounding hit. And with the Watcher's Eye, our Impales last two additional hits, allowing their life cycle to be extended, dealing much more damage when hitting bosses many times in a row. Furthermore, we'll also be increasing the effect of those Impales by over 100%, more than doubling their damage. This is my foremost recommendation for the build, and increases our boss killing potential pretty drastically. And with that, our journey through the gear is complete, and it's time for us to jump into the skills and the links that make this build possible. And we'll begin, of course, with the Lacerate, which we'll be linking first to Melee Physical Damage Support, which at level 20 grants us 49% more melee physical damage. For the third link, we'll be utilizing Fortify, which at level 20 grants us 34% increased Fortify duration, 34% more damage with melee hits. 
and 34% more damage with our bleeds. This gem serves us fantastically well and grants us fortify in every situation. And with our increased fortify effect from both Steadfast and Rampart, we will be taking 31% reduced damage from hits as long as fortify is up, which it always will be. For our fourth link, we'll be incorporating Multi-Strike. This grants us at level 20, 44% more melee attack speed at the cost of 10% less attack damage. This causes us to attack with Lacerate three times every time we attack, although it can be cancelled midway. For each repeat of the skill, you'll be dealing more damage, 22% on the first repeat and 44% on the second repeat. Multi-Strike may feel a little bit clunky early on when you don't have a lot of attack speed in the build, but as you continue to level, it will only feel better and better until you finally wonder how you ever played without it. For the fifth link, we'll have Brutality, which causes our skills to deal 59% more physical damage, one of the biggest buffs we can possibly get. But in return, we're going to be dealing no chaos damage and no elemental damage in any capacity with Lacerate. This swap serves us just fine, just make sure that you're focusing all of your gear and every selection on stacking physical damage alone. And for our sixth and final link, we have Impale Support, which at level 20 grants us an additional 40% chance to impale enemies on hit, 49% increased impale effect, and we deal 15% more physical damage with Lacerate. We reach 100% chance to impale on every hit with Lacerate, and this gem provides us with the biggest percentage boost from one source, and it also manages to grant us, by itself, around 50% increased effect of impale. We get 30% from the tree, and 20% from our dread banner, giving us over 100% increased impale effect. And on top of that, even just inherently boosts our damage. This is a fantastic final link, and is crucial to making the impale setup work properly. There's only one real alternative option that I would think to mention, and that's specifically if you're looking to drop all of the impale from the build. If you want impale, you're going to want impale support. But if for whatever reason you want to drop it completely from the build, go ahead and include Ruthless. This gives you a gigantic damage bonus on every third attack, causing you to deal 132% more melee damage. And my highest recommendation is the initial six link, including impale. From here on out, I'll be discussing skills and links correlated to where they were socketed into the build. First up is going to be the gloves, as I specifically used Essence of Insanity crafted gloves for that 16% more attack and cast speed. I socketed in a 2 link of Leap Slam combined with faster attacks. This setup makes our Leap Slams very frantic and improves our overall map traversal heavily. We'll also be adding a portal, which can be linked or unlinked, it doesn't have any effect. It will simply be here to benefit from the 16% more cast speed, making it more convenient to use. And finally, I decided to incorporate either Vol Haste or Vol Grace in this slot. Our overall slots in this build are very limited because of our use of Combs Roots. If you are using Combs Roots, you're going to have to make a decision on whether you want to use Vol Haste for the increased movement speed and attack speed, or if you want Vol Grace for the added chance to dodge spell and attack hits. If you're not using Combs Roots, you may be able to find room for both of the gems as well as an increased duration support attached to them, making them last much longer. Both Vol skills require a lot of dexterity, so use one at the highest level that you're capable of. Moving right along, we're going to talk about what I chose to socket into the helmet slot. First up, we have Blood and Sand, which doesn't need to be linked to anything. We have this in the build, of course, because it correlates very directly with Lacerate itself, and changes its functionality drastically depending on which stance we're in. Of course, using Sand Stance for the huge AoE, and Blood Stance to deal much more potent damage in a smaller area. Also in the helmet slot, and doesn't need to be linked, is going to be Vol Ancestral Wardchief. This is an insanely powerful tool to use in any situation where you want a lot of damage, especially during boss fights. You can summon two different Vol Ancestral Wardchief totems, and as long as you have a totem active, you're getting access to the main effect, which is going to be 32% more melee damage while that totem is active. This is a drastic buff to our damage, and if you can stagger out the two different totems throughout a boss fight, you're going to be dealing much more damage, and this is very worth having in the build. And for the final two slots in the helmet, we're going to want to have these two linked. They can also be linked to Blood and Sand and Vol Ancestral Warchief, and it will have no negative effect. But for those final two slots, we're going to want a vulnerability at a very high level, preferably at level 20 or level 21, and we're going to be supporting that with a Blasphemy support. This turns vulnerability from being a spell that you actively use into an aura that is constantly on your character. And because we're running in presence, it's going to be free for us to have that active. Blasphemy requires a lot of intelligence to make happen, so I'm currently running it at a mid-level, around 11. It gives you increased area of effect, 
the higher level you get. So you're incentivized to want to stack a bit of intelligence, but not at the cost of other important stats for the skill. Please keep in mind that with Blasphemy, we're not cursing on hit, the enemies need to be close enough to us to be within that sphere of influence. If they are at any point, it will apply the curse to them, and it will stay on them for a pretty solid amount of time, although during very long fights, you may want to get close enough to reapply the curse. This didn't prove to be any sort of issue for me, as in almost every engagement, whether it's a boss or a group of mobs, we get pretty up in their face, so you're going to be applying this curse to almost everything you're fighting. With that said, let's talk about what we socketed in to our first weapon. We're going to begin with a 2 link of Molten Shell, level 18, combined with a cast when damage taken at level 14. Cast when damage taken support will only trigger supported skills if they are requiring an equivalent or lower level. So when cast when damage taken support is at level 14, it requires level 64, and Molten Shell at level 18 requires level 64. They're equivalent, Molten Shell is not higher, so it works. If you wanted to raise Molten Shell to level 19, you'd have to raise cast when damage taken to 17, and if you wanted Molten Shell to be 20, cast when damage taken support would have to be 20. I have this set up specifically at these levels because I want Molten Shell to trigger reasonably often. It's going to trigger whenever we take a total of 1980 damage, when cast when damage taken support is at level 14. But say you just wanted to increase its level to 17, it would now require 2621 damage to trigger. So you have to find a balance that's right for you, just make sure that the gems are always supported. And the point of all this is to trigger Molten Shell, which gives us a huge chunk of additional armor and causes 75% of the damage we take from hits to be taken from the buff's capacity before our life or energy shield. The buff can withstand damage equivalent to 20% of our armor, which at its peak is going to be somewhere around the realm of 3,640. It will typically end up being somewhat less than that, but it will often be preventing 1,500 to 3,000 damage. This is a huge boost to our effective life pool and allows us to tank much more damage. This is a guard skill that I can't recommend more for this build. For the final socket in this first weapon, we're going to have Pride at a very high level, specifically around level 20 or 21. We want to make sure that this is either disconnected from the Molten Shell Cast When Damage Taken combo, or is at a level itself that cannot be supported by Cast When Damage Taken. Pride is a phenomenal aura for us and causes nearby enemies to take 20% more physical damage, which raises up to 40% if they stay in the aura for 4 seconds. This is just another ridiculously good damage boost and one that helps with bosses substantially. When we're standing in the same area as the bosses for a reasonable amount of time, they will start taking a ton of extra damage. And for the slots in our second weapon, we're going to be utilizing three individual skills, the first of which is going to be Flesh and Stone. Flesh and Stone is another aura and it goes hand in hand with both Lacerate and Blood and Sand. This gives us a variety of benefits. When we're in Sand Stance, nearby enemies are always blinded and will take 11% less damage from attacks when enemies aren't nearby us. And in Blood Stance, this causes us to automatically maim nearby enemies. And all enemies maimed by this skill take 16% increased physical damage. Next up, we are going to have Blood Rage by itself. Blood Rage at level 20 gives us 15% increased attack speed and also provides us with a huge chunk of our attack physical damage leached as life. The only downside being that we're going to be taking physical damage at all times, but we reduce that so heavily that we're not going to be noticing it hardly at all. This just provides us with a essentially free source of leech and a nice chunk of attack speed. And for our final slot and our final piece of gear, we have Dread Banner, which is another aura, but this is a bit different than your usual aura. The first time you activate it, it triggers like a normal aura. It will grant us a couple of inherent effects. It will cause nearby enemies to have drastically less accuracy rating, meaning they'll hit us much less often. It also provides us with our final 20% chance to impale enemies on hit. The final piece of the puzzle, bringing our impale chance up to 100%. The banner aura while active will then gain stages every time you impale an enemy, up to 5 stages per second. When you've piled up some stages and you want to utilize the secondary effect of the banner, you can trigger it again to place it at your feet. Based on the number of stages it has at the time, it will last longer, have a bigger area of effect, and also affect you more heavily. Upon placing it, if you were at full stages, which is 50 stages, you will get a really souped up fortify effect for 3.75 seconds. This will grant you a 150% increased fortify effect for that time period, but only affects fortify provided by Dread Banner itself. But for that brief 3.75 seconds, the fortify effect we have from the tree, combined with what we get from Dread Banner, means that we'll be taking 61% reduced damage from hits. And on top of all that, we receive a nice bonus to our impale effect, bringing our total to over 100%. This is a phenomenal aura whether you place it or not, and fills out our final slot very well, making our enemies much less likely to hit us, giving us access to a temporary but incredibly strong fortify effect, and giving us that last little bit of impale that we needed. 
And with that, we've covered every skill that I utilize within this build, and it's time for us to move on and discuss the bandit choice. For me, this comes down to a clear split between Oak and killing all of the bandits. With Oak, we get a little bit of life regeneration, more fizz reduction, and increased physical damage. A very solid array of buffs and is arguably worth the two skill points. Going that route is a fine choice and is absolutely not wrong, but my primary recommendation would be to go for the two passive skill points. There are a lot of things on the skill tree that I would love to pick up for this build and will have use of every single point. Moving right along, it's time to quickly touch on the Pantheon selection for the build. For the Major God, we have two really solid selections, being the Soul of Lunaris and the Soul of Solaris. Lunaris grants us a very consistent boost while mapping, giving us additional movement speed and physical damage reduction for each nearby enemy. And capturing all the souls will give us an additional chance to avoid various projectiles and more dodge chance as well. On the other hand, Soul of Solaris presents us with some great options, providing us with physical damage reduction, but only if there's one nearby enemy, making it a much better choice for some boss encounters. It also gives us a small chance to avoid half of the area damage we would have taken from hits. Furthermore, capturing all the souls will reduce the amount of elemental damage we take situationally, as well as preventing extra damage from critical strikes if we've taken a critical strike already in the last 4 seconds, and also provides us with the 50% chance to avoid ailments from critical strikes as well. Both of these major gods will serve you very well, I tend to go with Soul of Lunaris just for the movement speed boost and the more consistent physical damage reduction buff. As far as the minor gods go, I think all of them are usable with the exception of Gurugan. If you're utilizing Combs Roots, the increased attack evasion will do nothing for you. Any of the other selections will be good for the build and provide you with some level of utility. There's no clear requirement here and this kind of comes down to personal preference. My go-to pick is probably going to be Soul of Rislatha. It grants our life flasks charges every 3 seconds if we haven't used a life flask recently, and increases the amount of life recovery from flasks when we're on low life. This minor soul just gives us a nice utility bonus, making sure that our flasks are up a little bit more often and helping us bounce back up from low life quite a bit quicker. There are a lot of good options here though, so go with whatever you feel suits the build the best. And just like that, it's time for us to discuss the Ascendancy in a little bit more detail and also recommend an order to take the Ascendancies in as you're leveling up. Gladiator is a fast and brutal melee-based class, focused entirely on stacking physical damage. As you level up and gain access to your first ascendancy, you'll want to take right away Arena Challenger. This node grants you access to consistent challenger charges, up to a maximum of 10, with each one granting you 2% more attack and movement speed. You'll be gaining charges every time you kill an enemy in Sand Stance, and gaining charges every time you hit a rare or unique in Blood Stance. In practice, you'll have 10 of these charges 99% of the time, granting you 20% more attack and movement speed. This is fantastic for leveling and speeds up the process drastically. When you complete your second Ascendancy, you're going to want to go to the right and pick up Blood in the Eyes. We're picking this up right away because we want to get gratuitous violence to get those bleed explosions as soon as possible. Blood in the Eyes itself grants us a solid chance to cause bleeding on hit. It also allows us to inflict maim upon all bleeding enemies that we hit. It also grants us a small but meaningful chance to blind bleeding enemies, reducing the chance they'll hit us pretty drastically if it triggers, and a small damage bonus for any enemies that we've maimed, causing them to take 10% increased physical damage. And then from there, when you finish your third ascendancy, go ahead and pick up Gratuitous Violence. This once again gives us a big percentage boost to our chance to cause bleeding. It also grants us an increase to our damage with hits and ailments against bleeding enemies specifically, and gives us a more multiplier to our bleeding damage. But the real meat of the ascendancy is going to be bleeding enemies you kill explode, dealing 10% of their maximum life as physical damage to enemies around them. We're going to be bleeding our enemies on almost every single hit, meaning that most packs will blow up in a shower of blood. This drastically smooths out our clear speed and allows us to just completely vaporize packs most of the time. A super satisfying and valuable effect to the build, and makes mapping with it so much faster. And then, once you're working into the end game and you've finally completed that uber lab, grab Outmatch and Outlast. Another fantastic node for the build that grants us both endurance and frenzy charges on kill. This grants us access to a big chunk of physical damage reduction, attack speed, and more damage. Whenever frenzy charges are at their maximum, we get 10% more physical damage. And whenever endurance charges are at their maximum, we get 10% reduced damage taken. These effects are fantastic and give us a really nice defensive and offensive boost, a super well-balanced node, and one that incentivizes us to make sure those charges are up as much as possible. So in summary, grab a Renit Challenger first, then get Blood in the Eyes, grab Gratuitous Violence, and then Outmatch and Outlast. This is my primary recommendation, but you can pick these up in any order and the build will be just fine. And with that, let's move along to the skill tree overview and some leveling tips and early nodes that you'll want to be picking up. 
Here is the broad overview of the skill tree, and you're going to notice right away that we're very focused in this bottom left corner. We don't have to go far to get the nodes we need. Heading out of the dual starting area, we'll be working from the left down, grabbing the physical damage and life before grabbing Master of the Arena for the regen, melee damage, and weapon range. We'll work to the right, grabbing some life, and then Art of the Gladiator for a huge chunk of attack speed. From there, we'll swing down, grabbing Dervish for a bunch of attack speed and damage while dual wielding, and then we're going to want to swing right really quick and grab Hatchet Master for a big chunk of damage and attack speed with axes. After picking up Hatchet Master, you'll want to go to the right and pick up the Hybrid Life and Mana Leech node. We'll only be using this temporarily, and at some point you'll be replacing the Life Leech with Lust for Carnage, and we won't be needing the Mana Leech because of our Soul Taker. But during the leveling process, for just 2 points temporarily, we'll be gaining access to much smoother Life and Mana Sustain. Very worth having. We are working to the left, and you can go ahead and pick up at least the first 2 nodes of Golem's Blood, which gives us a big chunk of regen and a ton of maximum life. If you've got a solid gem to use right away, go ahead and pick up that socket, otherwise you can save that for later. Moving to the left, we're going to be running into a whole bunch of nodes, being Crimson Dance, Bloodletting, and Swift Skewering. You'll be encountering this fairly early in the leveling process, so you may want to hold off for a little bit until we get an increased chance to impale and more chance to bleed. From there, we're going to work left, down, and left again to pick up Splitting Strikes. This increases our melee range and gives us a ton of damage and attack speed, specifically with axes. If you'd like, you can go ahead and pick up Bloodless and even Soul of Steel right away for huge defensive bonuses. All of these can be left for later if you're in favor of getting more offense early on to speed up the leveling process. And in the areas we just passed will be Rampart and a Jewel Socket. Once again, if you have a Jewel available that you really want to get into the build, grab that Jewel Socket right away, and if you've got access to Consistent Fortify, Rampart is a great node to pick up. It grants us damage, attack speed, movement speed, and Fortify fortify effect, but a lot of it hinges on having fortify, so if you've got fortify, go for it. But moving back up the left side of the tree, I love prioritizing getting slaughter and cleaving as soon as possible. These nodes are some of our biggest DPS boosts, giving us tons of damage, attack speed, access to onslaught, and way more powerful bleeds. And from there, it's just a couple of points up to grab a resolute technique, meaning that none of our hits can ever be evaded, but we won't deal any critical strikes. By this stage in the build, hopefully you've hit either your second or even your third ascendancy, which means you should be gaining access to a much higher chance to bleed enemies on hit. And if you've also got access to the impale support, it's time to start pushing our bleed and our impale damage. So pick up Red Storm, Bloodletting, Crimson Dance of course, Swift Skewering, and additionally Forceful Skewering as well. And at this stage then, we'll have our keystones, a big chunk of life, our major DPS nodes, and we've pushed our impales and our bleeds as well. From here on out, you're just going to be filling out the remaining points that we didn't prioritize. Grab Juggernaut and Lust for Carnage, and eventually refund the two points that we used on the Life and Mana Leech hybrid nodes. Work on picking up all the life nodes we still have yet to get. Barbarism, Heart of the Warrior, Constitution. Grab the rest of the jewel sockets you may have left until later, finish out the fortify nodes such as Steadfast, and just kind of fill out the tree in all the areas you neglected until later. And of course, whenever I talk about any skill tree, I like to mention that this is just one way of doing it. This is simply how I chose to run the build. A recommendation. This is not necessarily the best way to do it, or the right way, as there is no right way to make a build. There's always going to be a list of pros and cons to whatever set of decisions you make. Feel free to follow your own path with the build and make changes that you feel comfortable with. If you think there's a better way to do something, there very well might be. It's always worth giving it a shot, and I highly recommend changing the build in any way that you see fit. With that being said, let's hop into the final section of the build guide and talk about the leveling gear and leveling gems that I would recommend when giving this a go. Talking first about the gear, I would recommend starting off very early at level 6 by picking up a super cheap Screaming Eagle Jade Hatchet. I would dual wield two of those, and use those up until the point that you hit level 29, when you can pick up two Relentless Furies for very cheap as well. These should be able to hold you over for a very reasonable amount of time, at which point you should consider picking up a Soul Taker if you can afford it, otherwise picking up two rare axes that feature reasonable attack speed and high physical damage. My highest recommendation for the chest piece is going to simply be using a Tabula Rasa. It's going to be equipable at level 1, gives you instant access to a 6 link, which gives you an insane power boost while leveling, making it a much smoother experience, and because all the sockets are white, you can customize the skill however you want and try things out. This will be a little bit more expensive though, so I don't recommend it for brand new players. You'll absolutely want to be picking up a Gold Rim for very cheap. This can once again be equipped at level 1 and gives you a huge chunk of elemental resistances and can be used throughout almost all 
involve the leveling process. I would also highly recommend picking up Wanderlust boots. Once again, these can be equipped very early and will last you through the majority of the leveling process. They grant you access to increased movement speed, mana regen, and prevent you from being frozen. I also want to heavily recommend, for super cheap, equipable very early on, Loctonial Caress Iron Gauntlets, granting you a big bonus to life, a ton of attack speed in the early game, and access to power, frenzy, and endurance charge generation. For the belt slot, requiring level 8 but equipable very early is McGinnord's Girdle. You can get it for very cheap, gives you a ton of strength, life, cold resist, flask life recovery rate, and also gives you a big chunk of physical damage, which we need very badly early on. For the amulet, it's going to be an extremely easy pick of a Duresso's Salute. Should be available for quite cheap, gives us tons of resists, increased melee range, and movement speed, and a gigantic damage bonus when we're on full life specifically. Finally, for the rings, I would highly recommend using two Paranda Signets early on. They should be very affordable and equipable right away. They grant you increased experience gain and a ton of mana regen. And if you're having any mana sustain issues in any regard, pick up a Thief's Torment at level 30 for a bunch of resistances and a huge chunk of life and mana every time you hit an enemy with any of your attacks, giving you a huge boost to your mana and life sustain. If this is your first character of the league, or if you're a brand new player, don't worry about getting all this leveling gear. Just play the game as normal and upgrade your pieces as you go. For those who are not on their first character and have some level of budget, I would recommend all of this leveling gear. For those on a very strict budget, you should be able to afford everything listed here except for the Tabula Rasa and possibly the Thief's Torment. Every other item should be about 1 chaos or less. And real quick, I wanted to touch on what gems to use when leveling this character. The Duelist gets access to Double Strike right away, which you can very quickly replace with either Cleave or maybe Molten Strike, which can just hold you over until you hit level 12, at which point Lacerate will become usable. Unfortunately for us, Blood and Sand is actually available even before Lacerate is. At level 4, you can start using Blood and Sand, which means that we've already unlocked a big chunk of Lacerate's potential before we've even gotten it. And from there, I recommend just using Lacerate to level through the rest of the game. And with those swappable stances, it already has access to great area of effect and good boss killing potential. And from there, throughout the leveling process, more pieces of the build should continue to fall into place, picking up additional upgrades as they become available to you. With each new upgrade, Lacerate should continue to scale smoothly into the endgame, and will continue to become more and more satisfying the faster and more devastating your attacks become. And with that, we have reached the end conclusion of the build. This has been one of my favorite melee builds to date, and without a doubt, the most well-rounded build that I've produced so far. We have tons of defensive layers between our souped-up Fortify, our Molten Shell, and the plethora of debuffs that we're inflicting upon our enemies, slowing them down significantly and making them much less likely to hit us. And even with all that defensive capability, we still put down bosses fast and clear really well. A truly flexible build, great for beginners and solo self-found players alike, as you can fill just about every single slot with a rare item. I really did enjoy playing this build, and Lacerate has proven itself to be very satisfying. If you made it this far into the video, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate the support. Thank you once again to the YouTube community for the fantastic viewership and feedback on all the videos so far. If you've got any feedback or a question on the build, feel free to leave it in the comments down below, and I'll do my best to answer. And if you end up giving this build a shot, I hope it serves you very well. And as always, I've been Asero, and I will see you guys in the next video.